Well, let's turn our hymns again to hymn number 476, More Love to Thee, O Christ. 476, we'll stand and sing. Be seated. Now we have special music by Mr. Jeff Morse. In Christ alone, and that's really how we should approach it. It doesn't our song, the song is not titled In Christ And. Too many times I try to put and, and or I'll do this or and that, and. But it really is boils down to in Christ alone. That's where our hope is found. strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, depths of peace, when fears are stilled and striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. I stand in Christ alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless babe this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on the cross as Jesus Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay. Light of the world in darkness slain. Then burst. 
bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry till final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man shall pluck me, pluck me from his hand, for he'll return or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Thank you, Jeff. We appreciate that. Brother Jeff has just walked us through succinctly the blessed gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news of Christ. Crucified, he died for us. He bore the penalty of our sin on Calvary's cross, was subsequently buried, and then three days later rose from the grave. The gift of eternal life is yours by simply putting childlike faith and trust and this one who loved you and gave himself for you. Let's pray together. Well, God, we certainly pause to thank you for the blessed gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you for our salvation, so rich and free in him and him alone. He's the only ticket to heaven. It is he and only he who said... I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But there is an amazing sense to that. As it took nothing short of the God-man to rescue us from the penalty and power of our sin. It took the sinless, spotless Lamb of God to redeem us. So it makes sense that there would only be one Savior, but we stand in awe of the fact that there is one. Glory, hallelujah. Again, we praise you for our salvation. Lord, I pray that you would be our guide once again as we look into your word this morning. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Turn the light on for us as we complete our thoughts regarding a beautiful analogy and a wonderful biblical type. That's our prayer. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, folks, it's one of the most beautiful types in all of the Old Testament scriptures. Isaac, typical of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have significant biblical warrant for this type. We have delved into that in the past. We're in a position to recognize that the type goes all the way back to Isaac's supernatural birth. Remember that Abraham and Sarah were old. I remember back when we covered that saying that, boy, when God says you're old, you're old. And Abraham and Sarah were well beyond childbearing years, and yet they were promised a son, and that son would come from their own loins. And Isaac, as you know, was subsequently born. His supernatural birth points to another greater 
supernatural birth. Remember, the type always supersedes the anti-type or the fulfillment of the type. And so in the end, we are left envisioning the Lord Jesus Christ and his miraculously being born of a virgin, conceived, can you imagine, of the very Holy Spirit of God. I love the explicitness of the Old Testament prophets. An example would be Isaiah 7 and verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. How can a virgin give birth only if the Holy Spirit of God, quote, comes upon her and the power of the highest overshadows her, Luke chapter 1 and verse 35. Isaac's miraculous birth pointing to a greater miracle, the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And oh, how we saw Christ in Isaac in Genesis chapter 22, where God, as you recall, commands Abraham to, quote, take thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and offer him as a burnt offering on, of all places, Mount Moriah, the very region of Mount Calvary. An undeniable, typical, biblical scene. We note it with solemnity. If you can go back there in your mind's eye for just a moment, we noted with solemnity that the Father carried the fire, which is symbolic of divine judgment, and the Son carried the wood which is typical of the cross. Isaac, as you know, the type was spared. But Christ, the anti-type, was not spared. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. And we even saw Christ's resurrection in Isaac, as Isaac returns from Mount Moriah with Abraham, his father. I love what the Apostle John, he's actually recording the words of Christ, but I love uh, what he will inform us of down the road when he says that Abraham saw Christ in all these things. There's someone who loved and appreciated the type before you and me. And it was none other than Abraham. He was watching what was unfolding. He, of course, was participating in great faith, but he was watching what was unfolding and understanding that there was a greater thing happening. Isaac, his son, pointing ultimately to the one and only Savior, oh folks, the typology, we stand in awe. And then most recently we watched as Abraham sends his eldest, most trusted and most loved and unnamed servant to seek out a bride for Isaac, just like the Holy Spirit of God is presently seeking out a bride for Christ. Can you imagine being a a part of such a thing, the Holy Spirit of God, even now seeking out a bride for the Lord Jesus Christ? Rebecca, here in Genesis 24, is typical of you, the bride of Christ. We noted last week that Rebecca was asked to do three things. One, to believe a man that she had never before met. Two, to go to a place where she had never before been to. And three, to marry a man whom she had never before even seen. 
And we reveled in the fact that that is completely and totally applicable to all of those who even now are putting faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, you are a part of the bride of Christ. We, we noted from the narrative that while Abraham's servant, and, and none of this is new to us, but we're just reveling in it again this morning. We noted from the narrative that while Abraham's servant was off seeking a bride for Isaac, that Isaac was home preparing a place for his Bride, and we had the quote Christ's words in John 14, 2 and 3, right? In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. We thrilled over Isaac and Rebecca's first face-to-face -face meeting. And we, at least Pastor Tom, had to hold back from bursting out singing face-to-face -face with Christ my Savior. Face-to-face, -face, what will it be when with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. Wow, we're looking back millennia and we're actually seeing ourselves again through an amazing and beautiful and biblical type. I love the movement. I know you've already seen this, but I love the fact that Isaac is moving toward Rebecca and Rebecca is moving toward Isaac. I love what Rebecca is crying out as she does. What man is this that walks in the field to meet us? And aren't we instantaneously whisked away to an event that could occur that could, could take place at any moment, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the rapture of the church where the bridegroom comes to claim his bride. And it's you. It's not someone else, it's you. It's you who have put personal faith and trust in him. It's you who have, uh, has agreed To believe someone that you have never before met and go to a land that you have never before been to and marry spiritually a man whom you have never before even seen. We talked about this last week, our love, when we... Were we to sit down, I mean, and just open up our hearts before God and each other and talk about our greatest loves, I realize that we can be off the mark in, in, in that realm, and I think that's part of the reason for God's message to us this morning, but, but I think for most of God's people, there is no greater love. The heart beats no greater for anyone save for the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he rescued us. We were on the road to eternal loss and ruin. And then we met Jesus. And the Holy Spirit of God impressed upon us the blessed gospel that we've rehearsed a number of times again already this morning. We've been watching the seeking and saving God, doing all that he needs to do in order to rescue sinful men. But the story has become ours. As you put faith and trust in Christ, he redeemed you, rescued you, saved you, and made you a part 
of the family of God and now this grand and glorious prospect. Just hold on. The Spirit of God is saying, just hold on. Keep on keeping on. Occupy till I come. Why? Because he's poised and ready to return. Just keep at it. Beautiful picture of Christ coming for his bride. Let me show you something from our text that we might have read right over. Genesis 24, of course. Take a look at verse 63. Genesis 24 and verse 63. Interesting. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the even tide. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels with Rebekah were coming. Did you catch that? That Isaac met his bride at even tide. At night. We love rehearsing ancient Jewish marriage customs. We've done that quite a bit. In fact, so much so that you've gotten a pretty good handle on it. And so I need not belabor any of this. But I, I would joy remind you of the fact that according to ancient Jewish marriage custom, the bridegroom usually came to claim his bride at night. The bridegroom would leave his father's house where he had prepared a place for his bride. And then conduct a torchlight procession to the bride's house. I can't say that Christ will be returning at night literally. It will be for some I can't say that Christ will be uh, returning at night literally because when it's night in one place, it's day in another. We were just reminded of that again early this morning with a call from Logan and Kendra and Lakin and Liam. They're actually 13 hours ahead of us, so wow, one of the reasons why we're on our toes is because we are constantly figuring things out. But if it's night here, it may be day somewhere else. So I can't say that Christ will be returning at night, literally. But what I can say is that Christ will be returning in the midst of spiritual darkness. And what's interesting about the statement I just made is there isn't any of you that are sitting here this morning and saying, well, what in the world is that? Or when is that going to be established? Because the fact of the matter is our world is gripped in spiritual darkness. That's why your light is so effective, by the way. Leave here today singing this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Darker the night. So let your light shine. Would you turn with me to Romans chapter 13? We have time to do this. Romans chapter 13, it comes into play here in a very direct way. When you get there, you'll recognize that the text is familiar to you. But wow, maybe it's been a while since you've read it. And again, very much applicable to this blessed typical truth that we're considering. Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off 
the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting or reveling and drunkenness, not in uh, chambering and immorality and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Folks, talk about a strong and powerful exhortation from God via the Holy Spirit of God to the bride of Christ who are living in a very spiritual dark day. It's coming. He's coming soon. And one of many realities that support that is this, that we're, this world in which we're living is, is gripped by spiritual darkness. And of course, once we go that far in our thinking, then you know what the question becomes. Are you ready? And the question can be, and I I think should be, posed on two planes. First of all, sinner, are you ready? By the way, I'd be so bold as to answer that question for you based upon the truth of God's word, and the answer is absolutely not. Apart from having put personal faith and trust in the one and only Savior from sin, you are not ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, he's coming to get his bride. And remember that the only way in in regard to that is via childlike faith and trust in him. Sinner, are you ready? The bridegroom is poised and soon to claim his bride. Are you among his bride? Have you accepted his marriage proposal? Have you said, I take you, Jesus, to be my wedded spiritual husband, Savior, and Lord? Christ, by the way, has already paid the bride price, right? Wow. With his shed blood. He died for you. Took your place on Calvary's cross. Bore your penalty for your sin. So that he in turn could propose. Here's the thing about that. You can say no. Now, if you've already said yes, you would say, how in the world could anybody ever say no? But the majority are. And forgive me for the simplicity of it all, but if you've not said yes, then... You have said no. And I'm here this morning again to tell you, to plead with you that now is the time. We have, again, biblical warrant for that. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Why? Because we may never pass this way again. Why? Because Christ, we are certain of this, is poised and ready to return. We believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming any moment to claim his bride. But what if you're not a part of his bride? Please accept his marriage proposal. So first of all, sinner, are you ready? And then secondly, and you know where we're going with this, saint, are you ready? I 
can picture some saying, how in the world could I not be ready? I'm saved, 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 saved. And yet, John writes in his epistle something that initially blew us away, the potential of even God's people, those among the bride of Christ, actually being embarrassed at his coming. Can you imagine that? Why would that be? Because you and I have other loves. We look at physical adultery as one of the gravest of sins, and it is indeed grave, but there's something graver, and that is spiritual adultery, where you're married to one, but you are unfaithful to him and devoted to another. And amazingly, even those among the bride of Christ can have in their hearts other loves. I've told you this before. If I could only say um, two words to you, and you're saying, oh, that would be a dream. Those two words would be, you're married. That would be it. That's all we need to know. You're married. Live like it. Are you and I in the process of keeping ourselves only for him? Do you remember the vows that you made when you were married? Are we keeping ourselves only for him? Are there no other lovers in our hearts and lives? Are we even now in the process of being faithful to this one? Yea, are our hearts and minds full of anticipation? Can you imagine? Can you imagine Chloe and Jeremiah about to get married? Can you imagine? Can you imagine Christ coming to snatch you? The bridegroom snatching his bride. Folks, I thought the type that revolves around Isaac and Rebecca was a beautiful love story, but it can't hold a candle to the love story between Christ and his bride. I'm telling you that it's the best thing that can be said of you in this earthly sojourn. You are among his bride. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes for just a moment? I have time to touch base with those who may be here this morning or within the sound of this voice who have not yet trusted Christ, can I just again plead with you? I can't force you to be saved, otherwise you would be. And even Christ, the bridegroom, it boils down to him proposing to you, but amazingly so you can say no. I'm telling you that your soul is at stake in regard to that. It's the difference between heaven and hell. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ is on eternal record as saying that he's gone to prepare a place for all those who have put their faith and trust in Christ. Perhaps the Spirit of God has tugged on your heart before. Maybe He's doing so again. I just want to reiterate the simplicity of the gospel. I just want to restate how a man, a woman, a young person is saved. It begins by our recognizing our sin and the fact that our sin very effectively separates us from God, not only in this life, but in the life to come. Can you imagine heading to a 
godless and Christless in eternity. But God loved you so much that he sent his son and Christ loved you so much that he took your place. And so it's Christ and Christ alone through his death, burial, and resurrection that offers to you the forgiveness of sin, the gift of eternal life, heaven as your eternal home, and listen, a marriage proposal. Would you say yes this morning? Would you do that even now in the quiet recesses of your own heart? Would you say yes to Jesus? Would you invite him into your heart and life? Would you take him? And as you're doing that, please, would you let somebody know? Would you let me know? We would love to know. And, and child of God, here we are again. Only one thing left to do. Wholehearted devotion. Yea. The chaste bride of Christ. Lord, thank you for these considerations. Continue to impress them upon our hearts. Save those who need saving God. And again, would you put it in their hearts to let someone know? And, and as we so often state, if they need our help, again, we'd be absolutely thrilled, so privileged to sit down with them personally and share more about the good news of Jesus Christ. And oh, for the saints, thank you for the reminder. I'm married. I'm married. And my bridegroom is about to come. How then should I live? Thank you for these considerations. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Turn in your hymnals again to hymn number 21. Love divine, all loves excelling. We'll stand and sing the first verse. Number 21. Father, we just thank you for this day and <clears throat> praise your holy name, praise the name of Jesus. Uh, Colossians 1.18 tells us to uh, give Jesus a preeminence and uh, we want to tell you, Tom laid it out for us today. Uh, we have a wonderful Savior, Redeemer, and uh, boy, just look up that word remit, that our sins are remitted through Christ. And we just uh, pray uh, for everybody as they go their way today. And uh, come back this evening in Jesus' name, amen.